Good evening and welcome. I'm Dr. Jason Parker and this is Site 311, Criminal Behavior. As we're moving forward and the topic for tonight's talk is on criminal behavior is actually on the developmental risk, which is one of the really big topics that I was very interested in talking about when I volunteered to do a new prep and create a new course. Just because I've seen so much on its development. The, the big question always in developmental psychology is nature versus nurture. It is the classic argument. You know, are you born that way or did you learn to be that way? And I, I think when it comes to criminal behavior, we look at that more than maybe any other aspect in developmental psychology is, was it the environment or were you just born criminal? I think that's really interesting. If you go back and read your history of psychology, there was a group that they believed was so criminal that they had a criminal gene so that there was no way to get the criminality out of them. This was argued in 1900 in New York about the Irish, you know, hooligans. By the way, hooligan, hooligan, the only racial slur you can use on national TV. Hooligan's family name, by the way. Okay. And a, uh, Patty Wagon uh, is because it's filled with people who were named Patty. And uh, well, that's a racial slur too. So just letting you know, being a person of, you know, Irish and Welsh descent, just letting you know on that. But I think the nature versus nurture argument has, has, has been well viewed and looked over. But also, I mean, even since, uh, I don't know, Eddie Murphy did it in Changing Places. Uh, you put yourself in the right environment, maybe you do turn out that way. So let's take a look at it, at least from a developmental perspective. Now, developmental psychology looks at two perspectives in time. If you've taken my classes before, you already know this. You've got your past and the present, and we're going to measure between those two. And we're going to look at what's happened between those. Development is not from, you know, gestation to five or 10 or 20, it's throughout life. And the development just changes throughout life and continues. So we look at the life course of people, okay, as they follow a path, trajectory, um, that can be in some cases littered with risk factors. And I find this interesting when it comes to criminal behavior, because one of the things I'll talk about a little later on, we get through these slides is statistically, I should have been a criminal, statistically. So, but uh, didn't turn out that way. Interesting. It's how I was raised, the environment I was raised in, the way I was raised, the amount of parental uh, uh, advising I had and watching and teaching just all suggested that. Um, statistically, I, I should have been a teen parent. And um, I should have been arrested when I was a teen and neither happened, so how about that? So, so much for uh, nature and nurture there. Protective factors, personal characteristics. See, I was going somewhere with that. Personal characteristics, experiences that can shield children and adolescents from serious anti-social behavior, meaning versus nature versus nurture. Perhaps some people are just born with more character. Doesn't that sound awful? Maybe. I mean, maybe. Risk factors. Characteristics or experiences that place children at risk. So we're talking developmentally here on antisocial or criminal activity. How do you get on this path? Well, the role of the family is huge. And I do mean huge and how well the family gets along, the, the nature of the family, communication within the family, extended family, and a big topic that your textbook doesn't really hit on a lot, the importance and the presence of uh, a father. There seems to be growing research that shows, yes, First off, family services did this, Navy family services. Um, one parent can absolutely do the role of both. Absolutely, positively, one parent can do the role of both. 
So a father can raise a perfectly healthy boy or girl and a mother can raise a perfectly healthy boy or girl. Seems to help to have both parents active, not abusive, active participants makes a big difference. Psychological and even the social environment. So it, it all depends on so many factors. Now, I added in this, and I kind of snatched this slide from a different lecture, which is why it's in black, because I just couldn't get it to match. But anyway, the definition of juvenile delinquency, and I wanted to kind of get into this. And it refers to a, a broad range of what we consider in society unacceptable behavior. Status offenses, slipping out of your room at light, night, crawling out of the bedroom window, drinking, smoking pot, truancy, sexual promiscuity, okay, shoplifting, criminal acts, uh, burglary, theft, can even progress into rape, and yeah, this does seem to happen with teens as well. Much of the discussion about the treatment of adolescents in our legal system uh, revolves around the age at which they should be treated as an adult. And this is where it's almost developmentally unfair, okay? Because some kids mature early. I mean, I grew what I considered a mustache at 10 and definitely had the makings of a beard by the time I was 15. I actually had a beard by the time I was 15. Absolutely, by the time I was 15, I had a full beard. Um, so I was often confused as being older because also I started losing my hair at 15 too. So, you know, I was more likely to be looked on as an adult, whereas in other people when they're 14 and 15 years old, still look like they're 10 or 11. So the treatment of adolescents between the ages of 13 is, to 16 is difficult because of the differences in developmental maturity. About 10% of adolescents are arrested each year, and the determinations of that status are made then. It's interesting. Um, when I, I, I played football at that age, and I was playing in community leagues, so uh, my mother had to provide my birth certificate at every game because I had a full beard and I refused to shave and I smoked. <laughs> Yes, yeah, okay, okay, it was a different time, okay? So in 1979, I went out for the football kickoff on a 13 and 14, 15 year old team, smoking with a full beard, which really caused a bit of controversy. But on the other hand, my mom did give me a cigarette, so, you know, it was a different time, okay? And I was trying to intimidate the other team by clearly looking like I was too old to be there. Worked. But it also made me look older. I think it was funny because the coaches would go, you want to know how old he is? Listen to him talk. My voice hadn't changed, so my voice was still very high. I had a kid's voice. But violence can be predicted by uh, early involvement with, with, and I hate this term, okay? Drugs. All right. What do we mean? Early involvement with drugs. Okay. Where do we qu qualify this, okay? Because your parent, you know, you're going to find alcohol in your house. Hey, look, CO2 canister in the house. Huffing in the house. Hey, look, I mean, yes, on one hand, it's a nice cheese snack. On the other end, there's an aerosol in there. I mean, drugs are everywhere, everywhere. So what do you mean by drugs? And I guess really what that is when we talk about predicting early involvement with drugs is escapism. So think about instead of learning how to deal with, with stress and to deal with life, you start adjusting by just um, being high and finding a way to get high. Plenty of ways to get high in our society. Easy access to weapons, okay, involvement with uh, antisocial peers, antisocial peers, God. Okay, that's, I mean, that's a legal thing here. I pulled this from a, from a um, Virginia website. Um, but uh, antisocial peers, other peers who are involved in, in, in violent activities. And um, well, how much attention the media gives, because the media really does actually affect trends. A cumulative risk model. I 
think this is interesting. I like this. Okay. Exposure to multiple risk factors is most likely to increase the probability that a child or adolescent or adult develops antisocial behavior. It's exposure to those risk factors. Maladaptive behaviors. Well, what do we mean about risk factors? Well, I don't know. Did your parents slap you upside the head a lot? Scream at you a lot? Absent a lot? Violent a lot? Change in parents? Regular change in parents? These things, these things add up. It's cumulative. So it's like you can deal with, and what you want to think about with the cumulative risk model, you can deal with a trauma or two, three, but when they keep coming, and they're coming at every way, between the way you're talked to, treated, you live, teachers, people who should be helping you, parents and friends, when they, they just start adding up. There's only so much we can take. And that leads to what's called a, a developmental uh, cascade model. A guy named Dodge actually has published a bunch of stuff on this. Um, the dynamic cascade model basically says once you start down this trail, it snowballs, it builds from one domain to another. Remember the videos I had you watch, okay? You remember the videos where they're actually looking at and talking about the school to prison pipeline. Well, that's the cascade model. Once you start down that road and you start down that cascade, it's hard to stop it. Especially once um, you're labeled. Danger of labeling. And it assumes that development in uh, one domain will shape development in other domains. So the focus becomes on protective factors. Trying to get people off of that cascade. How do we stop the cascade from rolling? So, again, I said this was Dodge. Now, I've, I pulled some of this out from actually several of Dodge's articles. So if you want to find them, 2008, 2009, 2016, he did one in 2006, and he wrote a book on this. The Developmental Cascade Model. A dynamic cascade model is the development of serious adolescent uh, violence. And Dodge proposed this, and this is abstract, by the way. I'm just reading this abstract. I just wanted to put up here, boom, here's the data, okay? And he looked through these different schools, and, well, by the way, for those of you who are interested, he did a partial least squares analysis. His analysis, his stats are, are terrible, terrible, terrible. The correlations are there, and correlations, not causation, but, uh, man, if you do your dissertation, don't find a better model, okay? Just, just trust me, just trust me, it's just... But he did find correlations and predictions, and they do seem to hold true. So this is where I think it's important. An early social context of disadvantage predicts harsh, inconsistent parenting. Parents don't, when parents have lots of jobs and little money, they also seem intend to have little patience with their children, okay? So harsh, inconsistent parenting, throwing a little alcohol, throwing a little marijuana, every now and then a line of coke, you know, and well, you get some real inconsistent parenting, which predicts social and cognitive deficits. You're not living in what Marion Diamond would call a rich environment. You're in a more bleak environment, which predicts conduct problems and behaviors. That predicts elementary school, social, and academic failure. You don't do well if you're not encouraged. Which predicts parental withdrawal from supervision and monitoring. So as the cascade goes on, the parent gives up on the child, according to the cascade model. Okay? Which predicts deviant, peer, deviant, what a word, peer associations. Hang out with people you shouldn't hang out with. I remember when my uh, 
my uh, um, tween, who was like 10, 11, had a new friend who was 16, and I'm like, uh-uh, no, I don't know that boy. Mm -mm, and way too old for you to be hanging out with. Uh-uh. Nope. Mm -mm, nope. Nope. Not happening. No. Nope. Nope. Because it predicts adolescent violence. And um, it's up to the... Well, I've said this for years as an educator. And I've been an educator since I was... I don't know. I started at 18 when I started teaching swim lessons. But I started working with the school system. When I was 23, parents are the primary educators. Parents are the primary educators. Not the school system, not the governor, not TV. Parents. Cascade model says it's part of that cascade. They're not getting good parenting. They look to their peers, which takes them down a different road. And then the parents aren't involved as much as they should be. So your cumulative risk model, it's also called a multiple risk model. It presents, predicts negative emotional mental health outcomes in the lifespan. So it focuses on the harmful environmental, psychological, and social influences that heighten the risk of maladaptive development. It emphasizes identification of a young individual confronted by multiple risk factors. So you add up these cumulative risks. Um, if you took my abnormal class, I talked about the gene environment hypothesis um, to where you have a gene for perhaps a thing in the environment triggers that gene. Maybe we got a little gene environment going on here, okay? Maybe we have a diathesis between stress and events. There's also, um, Abnormal, I talk about stress diathesis, where you have so much stress and then so much you can take before you do it. And it kind of interacts here. So no, I'm not going to test you on stress diathesis. Don't be scribbled that down in panic, unless you want to read more on it. I'm just saying how these other factors in psychology really do interact. Now, the developmental cascade model, it's also called a dynamic model. And again, it, it's predicted outcomes of the lifespan. It also can predict positive outcomes. Assessing the analysis of the risks in the developmental program and their path. Meaning, if you get the right teacher at the right time in the right circumstances, you can turn around any child. And that's the positive of the developmental cascade model. You can stop the cascade with the right teacher at the right time. Teacher can be the parent, it can be a therapist, the right a coach, the right teacher at the right time. Okay? You can stop the cascade and change its directions completely. Because children are resilient. An individual, the protective factor, it resists the influence of multiple risks. The problem is if you've got significant threats, both physical and emotional, okay, when I mean physical, I'm not just talking about getting beat up, I'm talking about food on the table, okay? Uh, I'm talking about heat in the home, uh, being able to get to school, knowing you're going to have a roof over your head. Positive adaptation and sufficient protective factors. Protective factors are the things around your resilience. Um, other family members, friends, neighbors. Uh, one of the best resilience I ever had, I think, as a teen, when I was dealing with my own pathway. I remember one of my neighbors. Now, the funny thing is, is my neighbor had like, she had like, you know, six, five kids. Five kids. And I was kicked out, which happened pretty regularly between my ages of 12 and 13. So I've been I've been kicked out of the house again. And it's interesting because here she is with all these kids and she's like, nope, come over here. We got room. You can crash on the floor. You need a home. Gave me resilience. Gave me resilience. Because somebody stepped up and said, I care. Big deal. 
family risk and protective factors, poverty, adverse effects on child development. It's intertwined with a large number of influences. Poverty cofactors. If you live in poverty, you're more likely to be victims, not offenders of crime. If you live in poverty, you're more likely to get robbed. You're more likely to get ripped off. You're more likely to get rolled. You're more likely somebody to break into your house. You're more likely to get hustled. You're not yourself more likely to commit crime. You're more likely to be the victim of crime. That says a lot. Single parent households. Well, we're rife with that. Influence of other interacting variables. Now keep in mind, when I say we're rife with single parent households, I'm, I'm not gonna get on a soapbox here, okay? But what I have learned and witnessed from being an instructor, a therapist, and working with family services, and working with universities, and working with schools, and well, one good parent is better than two abusive. And I think some of the worst things you'll ever see is when somebody stays in a bad, abusive household for the good of the children. For the good of the children, get them in a safe environment. Focus on the process, not the structure of the family. Focus on whether your family is you and your child. If that's the family, that's the family. You focus on that. If it's you and the child and a dog or cat, you know. You, you focus on that structure, whether it be one or ten people, and the importance of getting that together and bringing them back in. And um, I know many, many people, both male and female, who have raised a child on their own quite, quite successfully. But ask any parent. It's easier if you have help. Parental styles. Now, this is, okay, this is old stuff. You should have learned this in your intro and the four parenting styles. Uh, but this is where I say that, um, well, I was supposed to be a criminal. I'm a latchkey kid. From the time I was eight, I had a key to the house and a sticky tab. When I came in, there was a sticky tab every day. It said, call me. So I Got the sticky tab. My mom actually wrote one every day, too. A diff she didn't like recycle. She wrote a fresh one every day. Um, I was supposed to call her when I got home from school. Like, I didn't get that message. In fact, she had me so trained. Up until the day she died, I still called her every day. Generally, right when I got out of school, because I'm still in school teaching. So, I would be calling her on the way home. Hey, Mom, how's it going? I had an authoritative parent. Authoritative. Okay. Not authoritarian. Authoritarian is you're going to do it or else. Authoritarian, do it or else. Permissive, nah, I don't care. Whatever. You'll raise yourself. Authoritative, there were rules. Okay. I had to come straight home from school. I had to call my mom at her office. I had to be ready for football or baseball practice. I had about two, three hours in between. I could do whatever sometimes I had to start to know. Or take out the trash. Or something along those lines. Always let the dog out. As soon as you get home, you let the dog out. Because, you know, that's what you do when you're in the house. And then neglecting. And neglecting is when they just forget they have children. Um, I think one of the hor horrific things I saw growing up was... Now, keep in mind, I'm six years old myself. So why didn't I call the police? I was six. I didn't think about it. But I do remember looking out across the street and seeing this four-year-old kid on the roof naked. Because the parents were never home. They, they came home every two or three days. And the older siblings had locked the kid out naked on the roof. Because they were mad at the kid. And you know I see that today. I'm throwing a blanket up there and I'm calling cops. Um, completely neglectful completely forgotten and uh used to see a lot more of that but the four parenting styles so you got authoritative authoritarian permissive uninvolved uninvolved neglected doesn't enforce limits versus demanding sensitive and responsive okay or stern and punitive so i guess i had the best kind of authoritative i don't know i'm kind of pro-authoritative i do know some people believe it or not 
There are people who are authoritarian and their kids make it through just fine. I met this guy, he's a doctor, okay, he's an MD, and he was doing his um, region, his uh, residency at Johns Hopkins. And he's a big guy too. He's from the south side of Chicago, you know, bad, bad Leroy Brown. And I'm like, dude, how did you make it here from the south side of Chicago? I mean, it's like a rule. You got to be in a gang or you get beat up. And he said, my grandma was so strict. We had a fence and I was to get off that bus to walk in the fence and I stay in the yard. And my job is to study and learn. She kept him under lock and key under one of the worst neighborhoods in our country. And lo and behold, he's a surgeon. So I guess it worked. And I know people who are permissive. Now, keep the problem with authoritarian, of course, is you can get too abusive. Authoritarian, they are too stern. Um, and that's a whole thing on punishment. Hey, take my learning course on that. We'll talk about that. Permissive, okay? I know, actually, believe it or not, permissive is like they let the child do what they want to do, but it's also very much humanitarian. People are basically good. And you let your children learn and make their own decisions. And I actually do know some people who were raised by very liberal parents who were very permissive and their kids are very successful, but also for some, hey, nature versus nurture. It's not what they needed. And again, mine was authoritative. I had rules, but not a lot of actual overseeing, not a lot of punishment, just had to report and be aware of timetables, schedules. Poor parental monitoring, though, is a strong risk factor. And see, that's the difference. When you look at those four styles, okay, are they still monitoring? That's where neglectful comes in. Permissive doesn't mean they're not still watching what you're doing. They're just not real critical of it. Neglectful. Here we have problems. I mean, you want to know what happens with poor parental monitoring or no parental monitoring? Read the Lord of the Flies. It's as easy as that. And it happens over and over and over again. Now, obviously, if your parents have a problem with psychopathology themselves, it's going to affect and the, increase the likelihood that the child will be criminal. It'd develop to be more, I hate saying criminal, but they're more likely to break rules. Your parents are heavily depressed, psychotic, alcoholic, violent, and of course, back to neglectful parenting, neglectful. So if they're neglectful, of, of course, you know, you got to eat, you got to eat. Attachment. Now, Ainsworth is the one on attachment, okay? So I really wanted to make sure I remind you of Ainsworth on that. And attachment theory does have to do with parenting on this. But also attachment correlated criminal behavior. Now, I'm going to blow your mind here. Okay? What if your secure attachment and it's securely attached to your parents. But your parents are criminal. They're a crime family. I know. I know. Can you imagine? You trust them. Tune to their emotions. You can communicate with them. It's just your way of life. It's how you do it. I just think about that whenever I've watched Goodfellas. I watch Goodfellas and I'm like... Because he talks about that. And Goodfellas, by the way, is a, is a true story. It's not a documentary, but it is based on a true story of a guy who grew up in an environment, in a crime environment, and uh, was part of that. So, if you are attached to one's family and parents and a partner, you're more likely to have your, I guess, be reeled in. Let's put it that way.
you're more likely to get reeled in before you do anything way out there and way criminal as in well let's 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 really let's, let's think about what you're about to do i i think that would be be probably a, a good way to explain it. because when you are neglectful as a parent well you deal with and hang out with other people who often tend to be no people from their parent. I mean, who else lets you hang out till midnight? Or in my case, 11. I had to be home at 11. Till I was 16. Then it was midnight. But peer influence is a strong predictor of adolescent substance use and delinquent behavior. Increases the susceptibility of peer influence during adolescence. Peer relationships fill a requirement that cannot be addressed by parents or siblings alone. They offer a forum for expressing feelings, rules, learning intimacy. Peer group relationships increase during middle and late childhood. When we hit adolescence, we change our friends, okay? The friends you had in elementary school are not the friends you had probably in high school. In a few cases, there are, but not in most cases. In most cases, you kind of shift your friends. But the friends you develop in middle school, high school can be more likely to, to be lifelong friends. And parents may not realize how much they uh, influence the type of peers that their friends have. Parents can drive their children towards one group of people or another. Early attachment histories influence later relationships and peers. Parents choose environments in which adolescents live, go to school, and hang out. They suggest strategies for maintaining peer relationships and suggestions. I love this. One lady I worked with, I saw uh, her bulletin board for her uh, ADHD kid. Have you called your friends this week? <laughs> it's homework. The kids' homework every week was to make sure they contacted one of their friends and maintained a relationship. Peers influence opposition to parents' preferences. In only some areas, nonconformity and anti-conformity occur. However, when adolescents refuse to conform to either peer or social standards, so they can also go against everything the parent says. You can't make me do that, okay? I'll do that on my own. And this is where in danger of, you know, being a victim of crime comes into play. See, my youngest boy, now he works at the shipyard. Didn't want to get a driver's license when he was in high school. Or early in or early in his twenties, and I'm like, uh, dude, you know, you're 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 walking to work every day in um, Portsmouth. You really should drive. Just saying. Peer status. I I brought this in. I added this into your notes because I think it's important. And I say this on peer status and accepted on peer relationships because I was um, a student at Virginia Tech when the 32 happened, when they, when they shot everybody. In fact, the time that I was at Tech, there were about six faculty suicides, students. They don't talk a lot about the faculty suicides, students who jumped out of windows. One student um, jumped in front of an 18-wheeler on 401. I mean, just dove under the tires. Left a suicide note, though. And then, of course, the guy who shot up the school. Another one cut off some girl's head in the cafeteria. Literally cut her head off in the cafeteria. And you're going, didn't anybody stop him? Six different, seven different people were stabbed by this guy uh, while they tried to stop him from doing it. So several people were very injured. But what... I'm telling you these ugly stories because here's where they come from. Let's just move right down to, okay? Rejected children. The one thing that was common in all of those stories I just related to, at least to my knowledge, they were rejected by their peers. 
And it seems to be a very powerful thing, especially when it comes to violence, is rejected from your peers. Um, people who are rejected tend to be more impulsive, aggressive, and while well, they are disliked by their peers and they're more likely to be violent and as you can tell it's very easy right now to get a gun and and that's by legal ways okay i mean you talk politically about how oh if somebody wants to get a gun a bad guy will get a gun if you look at these school shootings they just went up to a, you know a store and bought it i mean they didn't pick it up on the street in some kind of illegal way uh, peer status has changed that though. Popular children are less likely to be criminal, believe it or not. Reinforcing. Well, it's interesting because, you know, people who are sociopathic are actually also popular. I know. We'll get into that. Neglected children are unlikely to be nominated as a best friend, but they're not disliked. They're just kind of neglected. Controversial or unpredictable. Both best friends and disliked. I was always a controversial one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some classes very popular. Others hated my guts. Same thing in most of my jobs too. Eh. But the rejected, the rejected is the problem. The rejected is 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 the ones that are more likely to turn violent and more and more criminal. I mean, if nobody likes me anyway, so it it doesn't really matter now, does it? Children without friends, unable to make friends, uh, become part of their peer group have tremendous risk for long-term psychosocial difficulties it's it how many friends does a person need well you need exactly as many friends as you feel like you need i know that's stupid okay yes okay so you need how many friends do you need you need exactly the number of friends you feel like you need for some people you need one or two close friends maybe three other people they need their whole group and their whole entourage it's an individual difference. So if you've got one or two good friends and you feel okay with that, then you're okay. And if you feel like you got to have 100 people and you don't, it's okay. Or as I thought at my wedding, when I looked out at this sea and ocean of over 250 people at my wedding, who in the heck are these people drinking my liquor? But everybody seemed to know somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew we were getting married and wanted to come see. So, okay, cool. Got great pictures. It was a good party. But still, you know. Research suggests that about 6 to 11% of grade school children and almost 20% of adolescents are rejected. They don't have friends. Majority of students who do not graduate drop out due to a lack of peer acceptance. They drop out of school because nobody likes them. Several studies provide detail about the circumstances that lead to this. Uh, Groland, Holmud, they're, they're, they're not a big name, okay? I just, I found their study, I liked it. Uh, and what they talked about was the peers who stayed in school. 46% uh, of boys with low acceptance by peers stayed in school compared to 81% of highly accepted. Females, there's a, a gender difference here, 65%. Uh, rate completion uh, when identified as low acceptance, but when they're highly popular, 96. Okay. Uh, Cooper Schmidt, again, not a big name, but just interesting study. Conducted a six years longitudinal study to uh, identify the rate of dropping out. 30% for rejected students, 10% for students identified as neglected, 21% for students identified as average. Only 4% who are identified as popular. That's before the internet, too. Even if you establish a niche group, you just got to find your group. Again, you stay in school. You're less likely to be delinquent. You're less likely to have idle time on your hands. You're less likely to end up in any kind of criminal behavior. But again, rejection. And I remember, because the guy who uh, shot up Virginia Tech, when he was shooting everybody, here at ODU, I was teaching that day, and I was getting live uh, updates by text. Uh, one, I'm from Tech, and also one of my students was from Tech. 
and they actually knew the roommates of the guy. And they talked about this. One of the strongest predictors later involvement is uh, early rejection by peers. They tried to get this guy to be, you know, hey, join our group, come with us, hang out, be social. And he wasn't. Also, the school teachers, you can look this up in the newspapers for Virginia Tech, too. Uh, he is referred to uh, council at Tech because of the aggression in his writing in English class. Um, so that kind of rejection builds aggression. And there is a little bit different, um, say relational aggression in girls. Uh, females are more likely to practice character assassination. Males are more likely to punch. Here's the trick, guys. Once you're over 18, you can't punch no more. So, you got to learn how to do character assassination if you want to bully anybody. And that may be the biggest problem you have with an office bully is their character assassination of you because, well, that wasn't your game. And, of course, if you don't have peers, you don't have the same number of opportunities to learn and to understand interpersonal skills. You just don't get the, the, the um, opportunities. Psychological and behavioral risk and, and protective factors, okay? Uh, preschool experiences, quality of care, academic failure. Hey, you start failing, cascading effect, school to prison pipeline, you get in trouble once, you get in trouble twice. Now that you're a troubled kid, you got a troubled kid file. And there we go. And how about this? Reading achievement. Literacy. Remember the literacy? Remember the literacy video? Okay, literacy is, seems to be a really strong factor and, well, preventing criminal behavior. Although, yeah, I know there are a few people who are like really brilliant who are also criminal. That's a, that's a whole other story. We'll get there. Language differences and deficiencies may interfere with socialization and, and increase frustration. Protective factors. If people don't understand your language or your communication or your speech, frustration will build and that will lead towards aggression. And it's interesting. There's an inverse, inverse relationship between IQ scores and delinquency. So, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of educating a person to understand the importance of, I hate the way it sounds, rules in our society. And if you can't get them to comprehend the rules, of course the inverse on that is really, really smart people can work their way around them. And do. ADHD comes into here, okay? And I bring this in. Now, the next slides are actually going to be on the diagnostic criteria, and I'm not going to spend too much time on them. But here's the thing. There's three central behaviors to ADHD and hyperactivity disorders, okay? Inattention, so you, don't, you, you miss the rules. Impulsivity. And excessive motor activity. Now... Antisocial behavior, aggressive behavior, and ADHD diagnosis places some people at a greater risk of criminal activity as an adult. Let me tell you about impulsivity. Impulsivity, you know, you're waiting at the stoplight, person in front of you, they're trying to turn left, they just won't turn left. They're waiting there, two, three light cycles, they won't turn left. So you pass them and turn left in front of them. Now, one, you just broke a couple of traffic laws and increases the likelihood that you're going to hit and be in a wreck. But you know, when you're ADHD and you got these impulsive decisions, you make impulsive decisions. And sometimes they're not the smartest decision. You know, you see a blue light behind you and you think, floor it. Not a good idea. Prevalence. I thought this was uh, interesting. Okay. Three to seven percent of all school. 2 to 1 to 10 to 1 male to female, depending on the study, more males than females, but that's 
because females tend to space out more. Males tend to be more aggressive, so males are more likely to get diagnosed. So I'll make a bet the rates are a lot closer than that in reality. But there are gender differences. And most people with ADHD have difficulties throughout adulthood. I put a little asterisk there. Um, I had a, a great talk with one of my bosses when I finished my uh, degree and got my doctorate. I'm like, yeah, you know, before I got my doctorate, I, um, I suffered from uh, dyslexia and ADHD. And now that I've uh, finished my doctorate, I still have dyslexia and ADHD. It didn't go away. Inattention is a lifelong problem. And remember that light thing I was just talking about? Adults with ADHD are in far more car crashes than others. More speeding tickets. More suspended licenses. And for whatever reason, more American children. I know, more American children than in other countries. Why? I don't know. Now, I just wanted to go through the diagnostics here. I'm going to go through this very quickly, folks. Uh, consider a criterion met only if the behavior is considerably more frequent. Uh, but here's some things I want to look at, okay? Careless mistakes, difficulty, attention, okay, does not appear to listen. It's a big one. They don't look like they're listening because they're not. They're gone. Difficulty following through on instructions. Fails to finish. Okay. Difficulty organizing tasks. Dislikes activities that require attention. Okay. Loses necessary things. Toys, pencils, keys. Easily distracted by extraneous stimuli. And you forget day-to-day -day activities that you were going to do. Now, hyperactivity, fidgeting, can't stay seated. What you'll see is they just kind of rock their feet all the time and they are on the go. When I worked at a clinic, one of the simple tests that I would do for an ADHD child to see if they really were hyperactive is I would put them in their cubicle and walk out. Give them about 10 minutes. Now, if they really are hyperactive, they follow you out of the room and they're climbing around in that room and they're going through everything. If they're not hyperactive, they'll sit there quietly and then you can get some other tests to testify that. But trust me, if they're hyperactive, they follow you out of the room. Or you just get to where you're not going to leave them alone in the room. Because <laughs> they can destroy a lot of things and go through a lot of things in a clinic very quickly. Impulsivity blurts out answers. Difficulty waiting their turn. Dangerous in adults. Again, difficulty waiting their turn. Dangerous for adults. We're talking traffic here. We're talking about standing in line. We're talking about cutting in line. Okay. Must be done before the age of seven. It should show up earlier. Okay. And, well, it, it may be a product of many things. But anyway, there's thing is with... ADHD, I think what really is connected here with ADHD is difficulty in school, difficulty in school, then you've got difficulty with your peers, difficulty with your peers, difficulty in school, you're likely to drop out. Do you see the cascade? See the cascade? Builds. Conduct disorder. Now, when I started thinking about teaching this course, I thought, man, I got to grab this stuff on conduct disorder and on oppositional defiant disorder, and lo and behold, the textbook covers it. Like, okay, well, this guy knows what he's talking about, or this gal. And it frequently does occur with ADHD, and it's a cluster of behaviors characterized by persistent misbehavior. Conduct disorder, childhood onset, adolescent onset. And if you're seeing adolescent onset, what are we talking about? We are talking about trauma, okay? Adolescent onset type means something happened, okay? Something happened, something big. Wow, now there's all these diagnostics here. Now this is from the, the um, um, Diagnostic Statistics Manual Volume 5, DSM-5. Now, what I want you to look at though, 
is when you look at the conduct disorder, okay, so many of these things, I mean, there's right on a criminal behavior. First off, aggression to people and animals. Cruelty to animals is a huge red flag. Huge red flag. Aggression to people threatens or intimidates others. Bullies. Initiates fights. Used a weapon that includes like picking up a brick. Okay. Uh, physically cruel to people. Physically cruel to animals. Stolen while confronting a victim. As in you took it right off of them. And uh, force someone into sexual activity. Yes, this can happen remarkably young ages. Just shockingly. Destruction of property. You know, breaking something in their yard, spelling out dirty words with grass poison, deliberately destroying other people's property, setting a small fire. Broken into somebody else's house, building or car. Often lies, cons. To avoid obligation. <laughs> and here's one that's interesting for conduct disorder. Stolen items of non-trivial value. Without confronting a victim. Stays out all night. Before the age of 13, has run away from home. Okay, so these are, are basically the, the criterion, and they lead up towards antisocial personality disorder. I know now you're going, let's hear about antisocial personality disorder. You got to wait a couple of chapters. Now, oppositional defiant disorder. Disruptive behaviors, problems in self-control and emotional behaviors. And oppositional defiant disorder has one of my favorite symptoms of all psychological disorders. You see, with oppositional defiant disorder, you lose your temper, you argue a lot, you're touchy, spiteful, vindictive, you have no patience with other people. Although, this is the one that gets me. I love this. You deliberately annoy other people. So oppositional defiant disorder, to me, the key is you deliberately, you deliberately annoy other people. But you are so quickly annoyed yourself. You have no patience for other people doing it back to you. But you really enjoy picking on and annoying others. How about that? That's my favorite. That's my. That's just my favorite symptom. You know. So Dennis the Menace. You know. Hey, I'm bugging you. Mm. You know. Uh, I'm bugging you. Am I bugging you yet? Am I bugging you yet? Am I bugging you yet? So. And, well, these things don't happen under any other circumstances, but it's the spiteful and vindictive nature of that, and they're just being defiant to be defiant. You know, there's like no purpose in it, just other than they want to win, I guess. Now, I've added in some things specifically for Virginia, because most of, the, my, most of you are in Virginia. So I wanted to add some things in on delinquency and the development of delinquency in Virginia. So some legal notes for you, okay? In Virginia, a juvenile is any person under the age of 18. And a delinquent is a juvenile who has committed an act, which would be a crime if they committed it by an adult. Okay? Now, a child in need of services is a juvenile whose behavior and conduct or condition presents or results in serious threat to the juvenile's well-being and physical safety. A child in need of supervision is a juvenile who is either habitually and without justification absent from school or runs away from home or a residential facility. As in, yeah, if you get put into a hospital and you run away, they come and look for you. Trust me, I know. When I was in physical rehab post of my surgery, I tried getting away a couple of times. But you know, when you only got one arm in a wheelchair, you don't. You kind of go in circles. I did make it to the door once, though. I was getting out. Uh, child abuse and neglect involves the improper care of violent handling of, gen of uh, juveniles as well. A little more on juveniles here as we wrap up this section. Okay. Detention or shelter. 
care in Virginia, a juvenile may be taken into custody if he or she commits a crime in a police officer's presence if the police officer believes that he or she committed a felony. Okay, you know, my, my kid got picked up for stealing a pack of chewing gum. Good learning moment. Great learning moment. But uh, wasn't a felony. So a crime punishable by death or imprisonment for uh, more than a year, or if a judge, intake officer, or clerk uh, issues a uh, detention order requiring an arresting officer to make a juvenile uh, into custody. If not immediately released by an intake officer or magistrate, the juvenile is held in custody until being brought before a judge or court official. So the detention hearing, keep this in mind, in Virginia, okay, 72 hours, taking a juvenile into custody. Juvenile is anybody under the age of 18. The detention hearing is not a trial, but merely a hearing to determine, okay, whether detention of the juvenile should be continued, meaning do we still have to hold this kid in custody, okay? Now, this kind of brings us up to, to our last slides here. And again, I'm ending on Virginia law in this case, just, well, if I'm teaching a course on criminal behavior and we're in Virginia and we're talking about development in juveniles, I feel like I, I, it's responsible to kind of, you know, end on this note. And if a judge decides that a juvenile is to be released from detention, he also decides who shall have custody and who will be responsible for the juvenile until trial. The juvenile can be further held in a secure place if they're charged with being a delinquent child. Detention will be continued only if the juvenile is a threat to himself or the community. And here's the big thing we come through. As we move through all of these topics in criminal behavior, threat, harm to self, harm to others. Okay, Those are, those are big criteria. And if you're a harm to yourself or harm to others, then you're very likely to be detained for some reason. Prior notice of the detention must be given if, okay, to the juvenile's parent or guardian, must be given to the juvenile's parent or guardian and to the juvenile if they're over 12. It's funny. Did you know in the state of Virginia, if you're 12 years old, you can uh, decide which parent you live with? A lot of people with divorced kids, a lot of the kids don't know that after the age of 12, they can decide who they want to live with. So they might not be able to make full custody happen, but they can absolutely get the majority with one parent. Do you know juveniles have a right to be represented by a lawyer at the detention hearing? The right to remain silent, just like any adult. And here's the key. And this is what I think I worried my mom to death since I had a full beard at 14 and 15. I looked old. Because at the age of 14, you can be tried as an adult. And I can't think of a sadder situation than being 14 years old and having a life imprisonment in jail. I mean... Sure, the ones who have that, you know, probably have done something really horrible, but at the same time, by the time they're 25 or 30, are they really going to be the same person? I don't know. So, I don't know. Summary of this section. What is my main point, I think, to make on um, the developmental factors? I think the main points I'm trying to make on developmental factors are uh, poverty, parental involvement, and uh, trying to get off the cascade as that cascade starts and things break down. So I hope you found this interesting, folks. It's a, a longer lecture, but I have a lot to talk about. Um, thank you for your attention. and. Well, I'll see you in a few more minutes because I'm starting the next lecture right after this. So thank you, folks. I'm Dr. Jason Parker. This has been Psychology 311 of Criminal Psychology. I hope criminal behavior. You found this very interesting. Have a great day.
Don't forget, you can always text and email me. Send me a note. Let me know what you think. Have a great day. Bye-bye.